Today my guest is Stephen Tobe of Microsoft. Stephen, how are you doing? I'm great, how are you? I'm doing great. It's great to meet you. It's great to see your talk on parallel computing. Well, thanks for having me here on Technology and Friends. Uh, you're welcome. Um, and uh, what do you do for Microsoft? I am a lead program manager on the parallel computing platform team okay. uh, in the developer division at Microsoft, uh, which means that uh, my team is responsible for helping to bring Microsoft into the future of parallel computing to lay the, uh, the foundational groundwork for building parallel applications uh, on the Windows platform. Okay, so you're building a lot of parallel computing features into the next version of .NET, .NET 4.0, right? And not just .NET, certainly .NET 4.0, uh, but also into Visual Studio itself okay. and into uh, Visual C++ part of the, as part of the uh, C runtime, the CRT. We've also been doing a significant amount of work to help uh, native developers write native applications using Visual C++. Oh, okay, so I, I know you're, you've got a lot of cool stuff that, uh, that you're actually talking about, but uh, let's take a step back. Um, what is parallel computing and why is it so important? Why do we care about that? So parallel computing is really all about taking advantage of all of the uh, processors in a machine, uh, such that if I have a particular problem that would otherwise be executed on a single core, um, I can split that, that, uh, that, uh, that piece of work up into multiple pieces of, uh, of execution and execute it on all the cores in the machine in order to keep them all busy and take advantage of all of them to make my problem run faster. Okay. Um, now the reason this is important is because historically, uh, at least for desktop applications and mainstream applications, we've had machines that have had a single core and have continually gotten faster as uh, with Moore's Law scaling where every two, or, uh, two years or so we significantly increase the speed that newer architectures uh, have for their CPU. Okay, so no matter how crappy my code was this year, I knew that it would be twice as fast two years from now. Exactly. Just because the hardware's better. Hardware gets faster. So it's the mid-90s, you go out and buy a computer, it's uh, 128 megahertz. Uh, for Christmas, two years later, you go out and buy a new computer, it's 256 megahertz. Two years after that, 512. Two years after that, a gigahertz. Two years after that, two gigahertz, and so forth. Unfortunately, that sort of scaling um, has, has recently stopped. The hardware manufacturers, Intel, AMD, and so forth, have hit a, a variety of walls, some to do with power consumption, some to do with instruction level parallelism, uh, that have prevented them from really taking this increase in transistors and this uh, decrease in size of transistors that Gordon Moore predicted would happen back in the 60s and 70s. Okay. And uh, rather than being able to continue to translate this into CPU incre uh, speed increases, they're instead translating into more and more cores, more and more processors being added to uh, an individual machine. So now when you go out and buy a machine, it's likely the si same speed as the one you bought two years ago, uh, except this one probably has twice as many cores. And two years from now, maybe it'll have twice as many cores again. So now instead of having one core, we start having two and four and eight and 16 and so forth. Unfortunately, the vast majority of our software is only written to take advantage of a single machine. You have a piece of work to do, or uh, rather a single core. You have a single uh, piece of work to do, and you have one thread that processes through all that work. In order to take advantage of multiple cores, you need to start breaking up that piece of work into multiple pieces such that all of those cores can execute in parallel in order to sort of re-enable uh, the ability to write that code you were talking about and have it run twice as fast every time a new wave of hardware comes okay, out. Okay, that doesn't come for free anymore. That was, uh, you couldn't just buy a new machine, run it on that, and let it go faster. You had to write your code in such a way uh, that it could take advantage of this extra course. Exactly, and the goal now is to, to write your application in a new way such that we can uh, regain that free lunch, which is a term that was uh, pioneered by Herb Sutter, who wrote an article for Dr. Dobbs back in 2005 okay. called The Free Lunch is Over. Uh, where he basically stated that um, we've been relying on this exponential increase in CPU speed enhancement to allow our software to continually run faster and faster. That's now done in order to get that back such that we can uh, rely on new hardware to have our software continually run faster and faster. We have to rewrite our software in a new way to take advantage of any amount of uh, hardware cores or hardware capability that gets sent our way and just utilize it all by splitting our problem into as many pieces as necessary and running it on all these cores. Okay, and so you're, now we, now we can do that today, right? We can write using the tools. Uh, I, I'm going to focus on .NET right now because I'm a .NET developer, but we can use the tools in .NET, system.threading, and so on. And we can write that code today, right? Absolutely. It's possible to do it today. It was possible to do it with .NET 1.0. Okay. Um, the problem is that it's, it's very hard to do. The, the primitives and the, the classes that are available in .NET 1.0 and .NET 2.0 and .NET 3.5, uh, and, and not just on .NET, other platforms as well, are relatively low level compared to the level of abstraction in, in which we think. Okay. And as an example, consider a typical for loop. Um, you're iterating from some lower bound to some upper bound, and you simply express that as go from x to y and do a piece of work. Mm -hmm. With .NET 1.0, .NET 2.0, .NET 3.5, and so forth, 
If I wanted to parallelize that, I have to explicitly uh, figure out how many threads to use in order to saturate the course. I have to explicitly spin up those work items or threads. I have to synchronize access between them such that they don't exit too early or such that my main thread uh, controlling the loop doesn't continue moving on until all that work is done. I need to take all that work and split it up into enough pieces to uh, saturate all the cores and to saturate all the cores for the duration of the run. And, and otherwise, I may give too much work to one thread and too little work to another thread. And thus, even though I tried to parallelize, uh, some of them will, will take significantly longer than others and I'll no longer be utilizing all the cores for the duration of the loop. That does sound like a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And there's some risk as well, isn't there? I mean, there is. As race, you start... The general, or race conditions and so on? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there are even some simple problems like, let's say I have uh, an iteration for, or a range from 0 to 100 and I want to figure out how to split that up. Mm -hmm. I have to do some math to calculate um, which iterations go to a certain thread and which ones go to another thread. And I, it becomes very susceptible to typical sequential uh, or serial programming issues like off by one errors, uh, where I may, instead of saying from uh, put 0 to 24 on one thread, I may say put 0 to 25. Very easy thing to do because I'm calculating these ranges. Um, and with, there may be very simple mistakes like that that I, that I make just because I had to write all this additional boilerplate code. I see. And then on top of that, as you alluded to, there are a significant number of these synchronization issues you run into where you have to figure out how to actually coordinate all these other things that are happening at the same time. Uh, so that is hard. And that's, uh, it's hard for a lot of reasons. It's hard because the problem itself is hard. So the code is hard to write. And so uh, you're building .NET 4 to make it easy, right? Exactly. Our goal with .NET, well actually, let me not say exactly. Our goal with .NET 4.0 has been to make it easier. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good enough. Um, uh, easy is a stretch. Um, there are certain problems where the constructs we're providing in .NET 4 will likely make it easy. But for the general problem, we're taking significant strides uh, towards, making it, um, towards making it easy. But there's still a lot of things the developer will need to worry about and think about at least when they're using the code that we're providing. So as an example, uh, one of the the main kind of top level programming models we're providing as part of .NET 4 is something called Parallel Link. Uh, Parallel Link is an implementation of linked objects that automatically parallelizes your link queries over your in-memory data structures for you. So you can add .as parallel to your data source and will automatically under the covers, rather than using the sequential implementation of linked objects, use a parallel implementation. So your select operators and your where operators and your group buys and your joins and your distincts and all that will under the covers utilize uh, in a parallel implementation. Now, for the most part, when you add as parallel, you're going to see great speedups, and you're not going to have to worry about all these lower level uh, parallel issues that we just talked about. However, that's not always the case. There are, it is possible to write a link query that, for example, mutates some shared state. Now, typically in a link query, you're doing read-only operations, okay. um, and it's a query language after all. But with link, you really are, at the end of the day, just calling delegates, at least with linked objects. Right. And these delegates are just C-sharp or Visual Basic or whatever language you may be using. And it can do anything you can do in those language, including touch some object and make some changes to it. Mm -hmm. So as an example, let's say you had a link query that said, uh, from i in enumerable.range 0 to 100. Um, so we're going to iterate from 0 to 100. Select um, random.next. So I have some instance of a random class, and I'm going to call Let's say I have, uh, before the link operation, I say random rand equals new random. Okay. And then I'm going to select out select rand.next. Now, you may look at this and think to yourself, well, that's safe. I'm just using a random number generator to get another number. But what you don't realize is that under the covers, in order to ensure that the, that the next number you get is different than the previous one, every time you get another number, it updates some state inside that random instance mm. in order to know what the previous number was so it can generate the next. So in parallel, you may potentially have two different threads updating that same state in that same object. Exactly. This is what we call a race condition. And while we hope you don't do this sort of thing with link, sometimes you do. And sometimes it is hard to find. And so, so those risks don't go away just because we abstracted away something difficult. Exactly. So the main thing we've done with this release of .NET 4 is abstract away most, if not all, of the details of actually spinning up enough work items to, and partitioning the work and merging the work back together such that all that other boilerplate code you had to write goes away. And as a result, all those kinds of off by one errors and anything else you would write to have to implement that code go away. But the still fundamental underlying aspects of you're running code on multiple threads and what are the, the problems that could result, those still exist. Okay. But, uh, so, quick question. What's, um, if I wrote code in parallel, like uh, using parallel, like and I only have one core on my machine, what happens? Uh, so the frameworks that we've created recognize the situation. Uh, Parallel Link will look up the number of uh, logical processors you have in your machine. And if it sees that you only have one, 
it'll, uh, it'll do its best to execute with as little overhead as possible just running on that single core. Um, so there will still be, excuse me, there will still be some overhead. Uh, if nothing else, you're calling dot as parallel, and there's some work okay. to analyze the query and see how many cores there are and so forth. So there might be a little bit of performance hit. There might be some performance hit. However, um, assuming the work you're doing is large enough to warrant parallelization anyway, that extra overhead should be negligible. Okay, let's talk about that uh, large enough to warrant parallelism. Um, uh, that implies that not everything warrants parallelism. That's true. So, so parallelism, first of all, uh, I just learned this tonight, it's in .NET 4.0, it is turned off by default. In other words, you have to explicitly call as parallel in your link queries. That's correct. Like that. Yeah, when you have a link query and you, you write your link query in .NET 3.5 and you bring it forward to .NET 4, it's going to run in the same manner that it ran in 3.5, no parallelism. You have to explicitly say as parallel in order to opt into the parallel behavior because there are differences uh, about that parallel behavior that may result in some different semantics and some different behaviors than your 3.5 application saw. Okay, so you, that's a uh, a uh, conscious choice that you, your team made to not break old code. Correct. All right. So what? Uh, so I, what? What are the uh, candidates for uh, parallelism? What what works well using this parallel model? So there are really, I would say, two primary criteria that you have to ask yourself before you look to parallelize something. Uh, the first is around: is it even safe to do so? Harkening back to this random example, it would be unsafe to add as parallel to uh, that particular link query because now I'll be calling. Um, rant.next on multiple threads on the same random instance. Now, I actually, there are ways that I can modify the query to make it safe, but by default, it's not. Okay. So you have to look and see whether the code you're running in this operation is safe to parallelize. That's one. The second thing you have to look at is, would it actually provide the benefits that you want? So parallelism adds additional complexity. No matter how much easier we make it, it still adds some level of complexity. Um, and in order to say that that complexity is worth it, you've got to have some kind of return on your investment. The same sort of, uh, same sort of uh, statement goes for any kind of performance work you do. You have some body of code, you want to make it run faster, so you use a profiler to figure out where you should focus your efforts, you do some measuring, you figure out whether focusing your efforts in a certain place would actually provide benefit. So you find some area where you're spending a lot of time and you work to improve its performance. One way you could work to improve its performance is by introducing parallelism. And if you had some piece of work that was highly parallelizable, uh, meaning that it was safe to do so, and yet it only took three microseconds, uh, and there was no way that making it go to one microsecond or, or even faster would make any difference to your user, why sure. parallelize it? Right. But if there was something that was taking an hour and it was safe to parallelize, and you could parallelize it and get it down to 10 minutes or five minutes or one minute, absolutely great thing to parallelize. So you have to look at a few things. Typically, how much, how much data is there to process and how much work you're going to do per piece of data. Mm, okay. Um, and what's a, uh, what is a thread safe dictionary? A thread safe dictionary. So we've talked about these types like random, um, where in this particular case, if you have multiple threads accessing this random object at the, uh, at the same time, uh, we're going to potentially corrupt this random instance. Yeah. That's because this random data structure, on which I'm calling next, isn't safe for multiple threads to operate access at the same time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't expect in its coding, in its implementation, that multiple threads will do so. And thus, in its implementation, it might be susceptible to say, um, as an example, let's say um, I've got a value, an integral value, like that might be contained in random. Um, and let's say that value contains the number one. Now let's say that I want to do an operation on it where I want to increment that value. So it'll go from one to two. Um, this is a multi-step operation. Even if I've written it as I++, it requires me to go to memory, uh, to pull out that value one, likely co copy it into some local register or something, increment that value, now it becomes two, and now I write it back. So now the value of memory is two. If I have two threads that do this, ideally what I want to have happen is one thread goes and grabs the value, sees it as one, upgrades it to two, puts it back, the other thread goes and sees it as two, grabs it, updates it to three, and puts it back. But imagine that at the same time, both of those threads went to main memory, saw the value as one, each of them pulls it back, each of them updates it to two, and each of them puts it back. And now instead of getting three as the answer, I got two. Right. Right. So this was due to the lack of thread safety on that uh, increment operation. Um, I've now gotten the wrong value. Right. And the wrong value is just one possible outcome. I could, for example, corrupt a, a collection, uh, for example, a list, by accessing it from multiple threads. As I start adding more data to my list, I might be changing both the, uh, the array that's storing the data underneath and maybe a separate count. Maybe the location 
Uh, I might have an array underneath the covers that's larger than uh, the amount of data I'm actually storing, so I need to know at what location does the last element actually exist. Now, if I start adding from multiple threads into this data structure, it doesn't expect that. Um, that information may get corrupted to the point where I may think there's more data in list than there actually is, or less. I may lose some. Um, so as we build up these data structures, like list or like a dictionary, um, we have some options. Either we can ensure that all threads accessing these data structures use synchronization primitives like locks to ensure that only one thread is accessing the data structure at a time. Right. Or we can build that kind of synchronization support directly into the data structure. So one of the things we've added in .NET 4.0 is this new namespace, system.collections.concurrent, which contains several data structures, including one called Concurrent Dictionary. Concurrent Dictionary is implemented under the covers uh, such that no matter how many threads access it at the same time, it ensures that the dictionary remains in a consistent and known state, uh, such that multiple threads uh, don't corrupt it, and we call that uh, a thread-safe, scalable dictionary. We say scalable because internally we could just lock around every single item but locks are inherently expensive. So rather than using locks, we use, uh, rather than using one big lock, in concurrent dictionary we use something called fine grain locking, where we use multiple locks in order to minimize the, the amount of contention for multiple threads on a single lock. Mm -hmm. We distribute that load. Moreover, um, we use a special technique, uh, what's known as a lock-free algorithm, to ensure lock-free reads, such that when I'm reading from the dictionary, I don't even have to take those fine grain locks. I only have to take those locks while I'm writing. And this enables very good scalability because I no longer have to write uh, to lock on every single access to the dictionary, whether externally or internally. If I'm just reading from the dictionary, I can do so without any synchronization. And writers that come in can do so with very minimal synchronization. OK. Yeah, I, I heard about that, and I was immediately drawn to it because it, uh, it's a cool name. It, it's no, no, like, <laughs> no, because of the fear factor. Uh, the, the parallel programming, it's not only hard, but it's also dangerous. And there's just uh, this, there's so much that can, can go wrong, Absolutely. especially when you're writing data, as you brought up before. And so uh, adding those things to the framework itself uh, just eases my pain. Things that the one less thing I have to worry about. That's certainly our goal. Yeah, OK. Um, so um, uh, if, uh, let's say, hypothetically, that I were new to parallel programming and didn't know very much about it, where's a good place for me to go and learn? Um, first, I would suggest that you strongly consider whether you should go and learn, um, in that there are these very difficult concepts around parallelism, things that you have to pay attention to that um, not all folks necessarily should have to deal with. Um, it might be better for you to rely on someone who is experienced with parallelism to implement the components of your application that are parallelizable and allow you to consume them. So first and foremost, I would say that definitely consider first whether parallelism is the right solution. Right. If you can get performance benefits from doing sequential, uh, typical optimizations that you might do in your code, definitely start with those. Okay. Then go for parallelism when, um, when, it, when you sort of have no other option and you want to be able to enable your code to scale across all these cores. Okay. Now, let's say you do decide that this is something you want to do. Uh, there are a variety of places you can go. Obviously, uh, search engines are a great place to find information. Um, if you search for something like parallelism and lecture or something like that, you'll find a variety of universities that have posted um, online courses where you can go and actually learn about the theoretical aspects of parallelism. If you want to learn more about parallelism in .NET, a great place to go is the Parallel Computing Dev Center on msdn.com which is uh, msdn.com slash concurrency. Okay. Um, and at the Dev Center, we've been posting screencasts and videos and articles and links to other material to help you kind of get up to speed uh, on not only all the new stuff we're adding in .NET and Visual Studio and, and Visual C++, uh, but also parallelism in general and the general concepts behind it. Okay, so you're contributing to that site. Absolutely. Okay. Now, at the moment, unfortunately, the site is a little unorganized, but we're working on that, and we're going to make it a great place to go to really, you know, if you're a beginner, where do you start? If you're at an intermediate level, where do you go? And so forth. Got it. Okay. And that's probably, I mean, you're out here in the Midwest, and they're back there slacking off. Exactly. In Redmond, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's part of the problem. No, fix that when you get our, our team works pretty darn hard, so <laughs> I wouldn't accuse any of them of slacking off. They're all great people. Uh, is there anything I, I, I want to hit high level um, things that, whether or not I decide I'm going to be a parallel program? programmer and dive deep into it. I still want to be aware of it. Are there things that I haven't asked you that are really important that uh, people want to know about? No, I think we've hit the high level points. I mean, the main thing for me is that uh, you have to understand what parallelism is, why it's useful, when it should be used, and when it shouldn't be used. Okay. I think we've covered a lot of that. OK. Anything you want to tell us about yourself? Do you have a blog, uh, an individual blog? I do, although I haven't updated it in maybe a year and a half. <laughs> okay. um, the main place that I, I've been blogging recently, since most of what I have to talk about is, is this material, um, is on our, um, our team blog for the team that we have working on our managed, our .NET solution. We have a separate blog for our team working on our, our native solution. 
Um, I've been predominantly focused on our managed blog, which is blogs.msdn.com slash PFX team. Okay. And there's a link to that also from the Dev Center, by the way. Okay, well, I'll put a link in the show notes as well. Excellent. Um, and uh, I know you've been, uh, you flew into Tennessee on Sunday, is that right? I did. I went into Tennessee on... Today is Friday at uh, 20 minutes till 10. Yeah. Are you tired? I am. It's okay. been a very long week. <laughs> right. well, I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is, Same I think, here. the my 41st hour of presentations this week. <laughs> Let's make it the last one. Get some sleep. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for having me here on Technology and Friends.